Everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm really excited because today I have Brandon Green. Uh, he is an award-winning entrepreneur and investor best known for co-founding Keller Williams Capital Properties, which was named Best Employer by the Washington Post and grew to be among the top 0.2% of brokerages. Is it 0.2%? Yeah, how about that? Wow, 0.2% of brokerages <laughs> nationwide under his leadership. Um, Brandon is really committed to helping real estate entrepreneurs reach financial freedom quicker and with more ease. And in 2022, Brandon launched his newest venture, Alchemy of Money Incorporated, which is a tech-enabled financial services company designed by real estate entrepreneurs for real estate entrepreneurs. And the, film, the firm, excuse me, provides bookkeeping, tax strategy, and filing and fractional CFO services, financial coaching and investments. And Brandon is really committed to helping real estate entrepreneurs reach financial freedom quicker. And as I said, with more ease, and I'm excited to have him as a guest today because I think this is the first time on Monday Morning Mojo, we're actually gonna talk about money and uh -huh. talk about finances and your relationship with money. And um, while it may not be, um, the only audience we have, a core group of the people that listen to Monday Morning Mojo are in the real estate industry. Um, but I do believe anything we talk about today is going to help whoever listens. So, 100%. Yes. Right? So, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited to have this conversation because I don't know if people are really examining their relationship with money enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, I'm thrilled to be here and you're you're right we we have this interesting concept of money in our mind which is emotionally based it's it's rooted in our 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 family and our history and many of us who find ourselves into entrepreneurism of some kind business ownership real estate or or otherwise are the people that are generally trying to plow new roads in mm. money. So we're simultaneously trying to grow our, our capacity financially with a lot of old habits or baggage or or maybe just not having the skill set, like the hard skills that you need to do it. So I'm thrilled to have this conversation today. Yes, I am too. You know, I know money is called currency, I think, because of the energy that it brings. Right. And, you know, and you touched on something that is really important that we do have, we bring a lot of stuff into the conversation, right? There's old habits, programming, beliefs, just, you know, um, best practices that may or may not be the best, but it's it's what we know. And then there's that, that emotional piece that you just talked about, there's fear. So how do you help someone um, who, who might be coming in with all of this, right? This mixed bag who... Yes. It's feeling intimidated even um, because maybe th this is acknowledging that there are things that they don't know and things that they're not doing when it comes to understanding how money comes in and out of their business. Right, right. I, I think a couple things are helpful here. One is just the realization that you're not alone, that, that we really all go through this journey in some way. Uh, even people who come from a lot of money, they have a whole other set of issues. Right? Yeah. So everybody has them, essentially. And therapy is a great thing, <laughs> as an aside. Though, I think tactically, what can happen is the degree to which you increase your hard skills around money management, that can really help balance some of the other components that might be holding you back. So, for example, if mindset is a challenge for you for money, the one of the best books I think out there is The Psychology of Money by Morgan House Housenell, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. It's excellent. And you could read about mindset. You could work on mindset. You could have mantras on your mirror all day long. But until you learn how to manage, read, and understand a profit and loss statement, yeah, it's not going to matter. So I always say, look, uh, it's a lifelong journey to work on your mindset around money and your emotions and how you feel about it. And that's going to ebb and flow based on other stressors in your life. Though in a pretty defined period of time, you can learn a set of core skills that will dramatically help your money management 
and will lead to better wealth. So I like to focus on the skill side because I think the other side is, like I said, a lifelong journey that we all have to go through, though I think we tend to avoid the accumulation of these great skills for a variety of reasons. Maybe we're not interested. Maybe we don't know how to access it. I don't know. But I'd like to say, look, let's work on some of your hardcore skills, and that can really mitigate some of the other areas that might be holding you back. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of education yeah. as well as providing leverage and service. To... Oh, 100%. I mean, uh -huh. Everything we do all day long is education. I mean, people need the services we provide. I mean, thankfully, it's why we're in business. And right, though we really believe that you can't just delegate out everything financially. You can delegate work, but you cannot delegate out understanding or you will ultimately hit a ceiling financially. And chances are the ceiling you have today is your ceiling of understanding of what's going on. And so we really try to simultaneously help people understand more about their finances to the degree to which they want to play, right? I mean, not everybody really wants to, right? right? and you have to be ready, but that's a big component we believe to growth. Yeah. And what, you know, what I know to be true about coaching is that you have to sort of meet people where they're at first, right? In order 100%. to help them forward, right? What is the most gratifying part of what you do? I think one of the most gratifying components, and, and, and this really comes to mind because I just literally had a call with a member, is when people start to click into the idea that this is not a one and done process. This is a commitment that as long as you own a business, as long as you're an entrepreneurism, frankly, as long as you need or use money, you have to be working on this. And so people go from, oh, I'm just going to like, can can this be project based? And I can just like get a few things done and be good to, oh, no, 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 no. This is, it's like your health. You can't just like fix your health in six months and be like, hey, I'm good. I'm never going to go to the right. gym again. It is. So when people get that realization that this is a, a journey they will always be on and they're like, oh, it reframes how they think about their challenges. It changes how they deal with their obstacles when they know that the, today's obstacle is, but today's obstacle, and there's going to be another one six months from now and another one 12 months thereafter. And so we've got to learn the muscle to deal with the obstacles, not just deal with the obstacle in front of us. That is a huge shift for people. And it tends to gear them into a proactive mode. And I can see like the relief on their face when they're like, oh, I get it. Like this is something I've got to deal with on an ongoing basis. And I got to figure out how to carve that into my life. And when they do, they realize it's ultimately not that much time and it's much easier to handle. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think realtors are unlike a lot of entrepreneurs in the sense that you, you start a business that you have an alignment with a passion for you're good at what you do. Yes. Uh, you're working with your clients, right? You're, you're, and a lot of real estate agents think transactionally at first, yes. and then suddenly something comes to, to their realization or is brought to their attention that it's like, Oh, I'm a oh. business owner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, I'm an entrepreneur. Right. And, and that takes on a whole new, you know, level of understanding and skill set and, and awareness and I don't, I, I don't think anyone's losing sleep at night saying I need to hire Brandon Green, but what are they struggling with? What are some of the things that your clients are coming in with in terms of challenge or, or yeah. questions? Probably the first big obstacle pain point that people hit that causes them to come to us are taxes, mm. right? You're right. A real estate agents, and I've been a, I've been a realtor for almost 20 years. We're the epitome of the accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. We didn't we didn't get into the business thinking, oh gosh, I can't wait to manage my taxes. Like right. no, no like, a million other reasons. And yet every single one of us hits the tax wall somewhere along the way. Some earlier than others. I certainly hit one. I hit it, well, several times, frankly, before I was willing to deal with it. But everybody does. And that's usually what brings people over is dealing with taxes. The challenge though that you then have to grapple with is taxes are a lag indicator or an outcome to a bunch of missing things in in front of that. And so, you know, taxes is what shows up. But when you start to dive into it, you're like, oh, I've got to go backwards quite a bit in order to get a handle on a bunch of other stuff in order for taxes to get under control in order for me to finally move my wealth forward. Yeah. So that's usually the sticky part that brings people in. 
And, you know, that's another thing I thought about this morning when I was, you know, adding a couple of notes here uh, that I wanted to talk to you about. And um, I think that wealth building, especially in, in our company at KW, is something we talk a lot about. It's becoming more and more, I think, of a buzzword. Yet you can't get to wealth building until you understand cash management. That's right. That is true. And and you have to understand cash management is different than profitability. Mm-hmm. Right. Can you and, talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So when you as an agent have a business, chances are pretty high that your lifestyle depends on the success of that business. And so a lot of agents will well suck the life out of their business in order to fund their life. Sure. <laughs> right. So the business can often be quite profitable but you've distributed all that income or a lot of that income to yourself personally to support your lifestyle, but you created a tax liability because of the profitability of the business, but you don't have the cash to pay for it because you've, you've used it all in your personal life. So <clears throat> you have to start to understand the relationship. I literally had an inquiry earlier this morning from a member. She's like, I don't get it. I'm showing $300,000 of profit in my company but where's the money? I was like, we looked at it. I was like, well, you transferred it to yourself over the course of the year. Right. <laughs> but you created a tax liability on the $300,000 in profit. So, you know, we talk, as you mentioned, a lot about wealth building, which is great. I'm so happy we're having that conversation as an industry, as a company. And we have to move beyond the, the aspirational conversation into the tactical conversation and say, okay, great. I love your $50 million net worth. Brilliant. Let's do it. And what's the status of your profit and loss statement? Do you have one? Do you know how, do you know how to read it? And are you following a budget? Are you on top of your taxes? Like, let's talk about some of these fundamentals that must be handled before anybody can even think about achieving a net worth goal that is beyond what their personal effort might be able to push through. Yeah. And I, I right now, someone is like, I'm going to turn this off because I'm getting a headache already, right? Because it brings up so many emotions. <laughs> yes. Right? Or, or they're getting nervous or whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Um, you know, why do you think it creates, for some people, a feeling of intimidation or a feeling of overwhelm? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of it is, you know, it's a, it, it it can be a lot of numbers and mm -hmm. for successful real estate agents, they're usually uh, high on the skill set of people and sales, which just behaviorally, that means they very well may not be as good on detail orientation and numbers. So it's interesting, like what's made you successful in your real estate practice is going to stress you out in the management of it. And so yeah. just that's, that's one big thing is it just sort of behavioral profiling, right? The people that are entrepreneurs and successful are running a million miles an hour and they're messy and don't respond to emails and because they're out and about, right? But all those skills that work there fail over here. And it's a, a difficult realization to acknowledge that it takes a lot of humility. Yeah. Then the next is what am I going to do about that? right? How do I support myself with additional hires? Like how do I maybe actually pull together, double some discipline to get a little bit better? So that's the first thing I'd say, Anna, is like there's this realization of you're personally deficient, if you will, <laughs> and you have to do something about that. So, you know, um, Brandon, uh, you've dropped a couple crumbs already uh, here on this um, episode. And I want to start to tie some things together. You know, you said you've been a realtor for 20 years. You just said something a couple of minutes ago about your own uh, struggle. What, yes. what really has inspired you to create this um, service, to create the alchemy of money, to be, I, I know that you're very passionate about teaching uh, this to agents. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your own story and why yeah. you're the perfect person to help an agent with this. Well, my story is I got into the business and in 2001 and sold like 12 million the first year in real estate, 20 million the second and 30 million the third. And by year three, I'm like rocking it, right? And 
And then I'm driving to a showing and I, and I had this little like inkling of a thought. I was like, wait a minute. I, I think I need to file taxes. <laughs> so <laughs> whoops, <laughs> three years into a lot of production and a ton of revenue. I was like, what do I do here? So I sent all my stuff to my uh, newly found CPA, you know, and he pulls it together and he calls me and he goes, you know, funny thing, I can't seem to find your quarterly estimated payments. How much have you paid for taxes in the last three years? And I'm thinking to myself, I I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I got into the tax hole immediately. And so on one hand, I'm on the top of the leaderboard production wise, my double gold platinum platinum medallion around my neck at the award ceremony. On the other hand, I was like $150,000 in debt with the IRS. I was like, wow. So that hit me. And, you know, I'm- And you're not alone. No, no, I thought I was. I yeah, thought I sure. was at the time, right? And, you know, I'm a bit of a hard-headed learner sometimes. That didn't happen just once. It happened two other times where I, I couldn't quite get ahead of it until I finally decided to make a mindset change. But that journey was really lonely for me. And- Part of it was I didn't realize that other people were having that issue. And the other is the financial professionals I engaged with didn't understand the context of my business. You know, real estate is quite unique in a lot of ways. And I talk about, you know, teams and brokerages and they're like, I don't understand the difference or, you know, so that I couldn't find good financial professionals that I felt could triangulate tax, legal, bookkeeping and financial planning. And so I eventually figured it out and assembled a team, but I thought, sure, it would have been nice. So eventually, after you know, selling uh, my interest in, in sales and brokerage and taking a couple of years off, I thought, you know, let me go back to that moment in time where I really felt like I was alone in the journey, and let me create a company that's exclusively dedicated to this because I I now know I was not alone, and I know anybody who's listening is not alone, and so. I thought, well, let me create something that that works on that and triangulates all these different services into one approach that specializes in real estate. And indeed, that's been a, a real big help for a lot of people. So that's I'm passionate about it because my own personal obstacles and learning along the way, the hard way and helping other people shorten their learning curve a little bit and giving them the resource that I wish I had had as I was growing my business. Yeah. For sure. And I and I think when we come from that own personal experience, there's a there's a deeper level of alignment and connection to the work. And, um, you know, we're just able to talk about it. And that's one thing I appreciate you is that you're always very real and you're able to, you know, just share things that are that are true about your story that I think helps other people then open up about what's going on in their finances or in their business, which as you've said, is not easy. It's not easy. And it's the elephant in the room in our industry that a lot of people look successful financially. They may very well be successful from a top line revenue standpoint, but they're dramatically struggling from cash flow, profitability, and taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got to talk more about that openly so we can help each other get better at it. Yeah. So, you know, you you now this is another business that you've grown. Um, what has been a challenge for you in launching Alchemy of Money? Has has it been smooth sailing and an overnight success or were there some challenges <laughs> along the way? <laughs> well, I mean, we launched it right into a real estate market that hasn't, you know, been the most energetic <laughs> mm. to say. And so we've seen a lot of these challenges up front and close with our members and and that's been hard emotionally, just having difficult financial conversations constantly every day with people, which is kind of a moment in time in our industry. So that's certainly been hard. And I think probably tactically, one of the most interesting challenges about this business is hiring really good financial professionals who are great communicators. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a secret that your typical bookkeeper CPA profile isn't the most a uh, great communicator, outgoing, ready to, you know, take on the, and yet our, our members, our real estate agents are. And so bridging that gap of like realtor speak and helping yeah. the financial folks understand realtors and realtors understand, like that is a big challenge. I mean, I'll interview, I'm in the process of it now of adding another CPA to our team. 
I'll probably go through 50 or 60 interviews with CPAs until I find one that I want to hire predominantly because of the communication skill set. So, you know, just a little peek behind the curtain here, but it's hiring is one of the biggest challenges I'd say that we have at Alchemy right now. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's any different than a lot of us uh, in any of our businesses or yeah, industries indeed. right now. Um, you know, which is probably a topic for a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Woo-hoo, the people, boy, and things would be so much easier if we didn't have to have all these people around. Right. Yeah, but I think you you touch on something that's so important. It's the um, the behavioral aspects of what we do and who we do it with, and yeah. how we try to not just meet each other in the middle, but really understand. You know, yeah. because like you said, agents are coming in and and they're they're connecting on the people side of the business and you've got uh, the rest of the team that's trying to help them who um, may not have the same skill set. So it's really an interesting way of, of finding connection. Yes, it really is. So, and, 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 and that is the work, so to speak, right? Is how do we bridge these gaps, both in terms of communication skills and, and also financial management skills? How do we bridge the gap between your aspiration around wealth with how you're actually executing, right? That 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 is what we're doing every day. Yeah, and you know, in your when you shared in your own story, uh, you know, from from the outside looking in, you were a very successful top producer, um, and you you know you had the sales volume and and maybe even other things that were tangible, you know, to see from that would say you were successful. Um, and sometimes that's what we talk about or have to look at is what is the cost of success? Sure. Yeah. Honestly, I still ask myself that question, right? I mean, we're, we're I'm grinding harder than I ever have before now. I mean, it, mm-hmm. and this is, you know, my, my next chapter, my next run or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, the first thing that showed up actually were some health consequences, right? And so I had to like dial it back a little bit to recalibrate, you know, how much I can put in. And, and, and I've had this conversation and and with my family, it's like, okay, I'm back in startup mode again. Uh, You know, will I, will I want to do this again or not? Right. So I think it's a constant uh, uh, conversation entrepreneurs are having, and I think it's healthy. I think Mm -hmm. we need that counterbalance in perspective as driven, motivated people always tend to take on more than they can handle. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. Well, and, and, you know, there is a balance because sometimes we have to be honest and say that the the stress is what uh, helps us, you know, develop certain characteristics, help us develop our grit, makes us more resilient, strategic, right? Sometimes you need a little of yeah. that friction to be able to get to the next level. And though too much stress in too many areas of our lives are not putting attention to where we need to yes. put that attention can just create burnout and yes. can create some, some, like you said, health issues. Um, so I don't know if you ever get into those conversations with your clients or if it's strictly around, you know, their financial health and wellness, um, or does it, does it go into other parts of well being? Well, it's, I mean, it's all directly related. You, you, if you're really burned out, you, it's hard to have a presence of mind to deal with your finances. You know, mm-hmm. it's burned out. I mean, one of the big reasons why I got out of sales and really brokerage generally is I was burned out by 2019. You know, I had spent almost at that point 20 years building sales and market centers and air, you know, and I was 100% burned out. So much so I forgot what I even liked about the business. I was like, I'm out, I'm done. You know, and people are like, what are you going to do next? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you know, uh, and I. Did you really feel that way? Was it that extreme? It was. I was really burned out. And mm-hmm. and part of it is, you know, I hadn't probably taken care of my balance as much as I should have in the preceding years. And so I got a little too far over the edge and had to do kind of a hard reset. So. I had planned on taking a year off and then COVID hit. And luckily I had managed myself into a financial position where I was able to take almost three years off and completely reset myself and reinvented my career and also changed up my priorities. Looking back on that now, 
I'm grateful I was able to do that. I think that was a fantastic time in my life. And now I'm thinking, how do I manage things a bit better this next time around so I don't feel like I get too far over the edge and so burned out? Yeah. And so that's on my mind now, right, is, okay, how do I lengthen the runway, so to speak, versus just run as hard and as fast as I can for X number of years and then, you know, fall off the edge. So I am a kind of a all in or nothing kind of guy, like I don't modulate very well. And so that's both my blessing and my curse, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I do think about this and talk about this a lot with my coaches and my family, certainly. Oh, so I was, I was going to ask you if you work with a coach. I have worked with a coach of some sort uh, since, let's see, when was my first coach? Hmm. Probably after three or four years in production, I got my first coach. Mm -hmm. John Prescott was my first coach. I've worked with John are, too. You have. Those that are yeah. with Keller Williams, you'll you'll probably recognize the name John Prescott. He was my very first coach and incredibly grateful for, for that. But ever since, I you know, really have realized, you know, two, two things. One is I don't have the master perspective. There's a lot of other perspectives out there and it's really important to have somebody else you know, yes. talking to me about that. The other is willpower has a shelf life. And if I'm relying on my personal willpower versus some accountability structure around paying somebody else to hold me to my to-do list, then, you know, it doesn't work. I mean, probably the easiest example is just in personal uh, is in fitness. Like I have to pay a personal trainer uh -huh. to be at a gym so that I can show up for my own good. But I've sort of said, ah, that's just how I am. I'm super disciplined in certain areas and I'm just completely a mess in others in the areas that I'm a mess. I just need to hire people to help me. And that is a hundred percent. Okay. One of my favorite questions to ask entrepreneurs or, or or people I might be coaching is how do they motivate, how do you motivate yourself to do something you don't want to do? Uh, so besides hiring a coach, how do you motivate yourself to do anything that may not be at the top of the list? Yeah, well, two things. One is definitely hiring somebody to ensure that it gets done with me. That's number one. The like second, alchemy of money, if you have issues with your finances and understanding tax law. hundred <laughs> percent. Exactly. If you're yeah. struggling with finances, then you should be part of alchemy and you should join our monthly call. Like, you know, uh, the other though, is I put the difficult things in the morning because oh. I know that my willpower is the highest in the morning. Not just mine. We know that generally people's willpower is the highest in the morning. The most difficult things have to be done in the morning. And and for me, morning is like before 11 a.m. If I haven't done the difficult things that I'd rather not do, or maybe it's not that I wouldn't rather, I'd rather not do them. It's maybe they're just, just difficult, mm -hmm. you know, take a lot of energy or brain power or discipline, shove them in the morning. That's been the key to my success for a long time is pack the morning with key productivity uh, movers that are prioritization items that are hard. And yeah. then after 11 o'clock, like I can slide into the fun stuff and that makes my day a lot better. Brandon, are you more of a strategic thinker or a visionary if you had to choose one or the other? I am definitely a visionary. I've got a pretty good execution chops, but my lead skill is definitely visionary. And um, so it's interesting you say that. I've, I that's something that's taken me a while to realize about myself. Um, but I would say 100. percent Like I, I think in, in the context of five to ten year increments. You do. That's how I'm planning out, like where this is going to go, my financial models for my investments and the company are out at least five years. So we can see kind of how that's going to be tracking. I think about my goals in five-year terms. More challenging for me is the sort of the shorter term. Hmm. I will definitely way overestimate what we can get done in in three to 12 months. <laughs> I, I can relate to that. <laughs> my, As my another team, visionary. <laughs> and my team will frequently bring me down to reality and be like, 
Love that as a project, but we're pretty busy already. We're going to have to do that in Q3. I'm like, Q3? Yeah. January. <laughs> about. What <are> you... <laughs> That's so far off. I get it. I get it. So when it comes to developing strategy and, and really needing to be more strategic in your thinking, uh, what questions do you ask yourself? Well, the first is I always find a part, well, not always, but now always, I find a partner. As a matter of fact, when I launched Alchemy, I launched it with a co-founder oh. who balances my skill set. So he's extremely execution oriented, also really good in strategy. And, and so rather than me like launch this on my own, I was like, I'm going to start day one with a balancer of skill sets so the two of us together can come to the table and really have a pretty good you know approach to things yeah. so that's the other thing the other is i'm continuing to work with coaches but i've also noticed that i have a different personality weekday versus weekend i seem to be able to access a different skill set on the weekend versus the weekday right? yeah so like a lot of my creative strategic work is on the weekends, which maybe it's because I can sit back, there's less email traffic, less volume of calls. Maybe I've got more white space and I can think a bit more. During the week, it's like, you know, execution and big picture planning. Execution, mm -hmm. big picture planning. The weekend is like, okay, how do we shape and move this puzzle on the right? Like, what are the key relationships that need to be brought in or enhanced? Like, for me, that's really a weekend thing. So, you know, just noticing the energy difference between what it takes to succeed during the week versus what's happening on the weekend has been another way I've sort of brought it together. And I'll, nobody's, I don't think I've ever articulated that before, but that's been a, a big component to being able to push so many things forward uh, as I have. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it's pretty helpful to, uh, to think about it and now put it into yeah. words. Mm -hmm. um, and um I hope you make some time for fun too. Yes, as my husband will say, where's the fun? So yeah, the answer is yes. The, for fun, we love to travel. We have oh, two big th to three big international trips a year where we go somewhere fabulous for a week or two or three. So that that's a big thing. I also have a farm in Maryland. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah. So we're in the process of renovating that and creating something super magical and special there that's nice. a ton of fun so that you know some, some people are like that's work i'm like no it's not like thinking about properties renovating them managing contractors designing rooms like all that's fun and my husband's a designer so it's something that we can work on together which is a yeah. lot of nice so i have a couple more questions before we run out of time this is so such a great conversation um, when you think about the journey you've been on as an entrepreneur over the last 20 some odd years, who has inspired you the most and why? Who has inspired me the most and why? Hmm. Well, I'm for, certainly I need to name Gary Keller. Gary Keller has been instrumental in my growth, both in terms of uh, the the product, the work, the the content and the education he's developed and the company he inspired and founded has developed, but also him personally. I really watched him as a leader and been able to develop a personal relationship with him over the years. So he is certainly going to be high on the list. Um, I'd also say my parents. My parents really set me up with a core set of values that I have just really worked well in my life. You know, just things like, you know, be your word, like whatever you say, make sure it actually happens. If you're unable to commit to what you said you committed to, then make a new commitment. Like, you know, make sure that people always can trust you. you know, that sort of stuff I'll give my parents a lot of credit for. They have done a, a great job of of guiding me. Luckily, they're they're still doing that. And that's great. now they're in their their mid 70s. So I I think that's another one. A recent one that's interesting on the financial side, uh Ray Dalio. Uh, who is an incredible, uh, incredibly successful financier, shall we say, uh, 
he has now written a variety of books and materials on the principles that he's used to build great wealth. Hmm. And so I don't know him personally, but I read his material, I read his books, and I'm inspired about how he thinks now in the, the last chapter of his life, he's wanting to give that back to the world. And I find it really inspiring and interesting. So those are three off the top of my head. Do you ever think about the legacy you want to leave? That's that, that question just popped in my head when you talked about him. I do, but I did, I'm confused by what it might be, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And every time I, we don't have kids. So, so I think some of the default legacy for my kids thing doesn't apply to us, which is great in some ways because it's creating more thoughtfulness. Um, we were having a conversation about this the other day. We we're like, okay, so we're building these things and, you know, they're hopefully to be quite financially value, valuable over time. Like, what are we going to do with all that stuff? Right. Mm. So I don't know. I don't have a really good answer. Well, yet. And, you know, I, and that's okay because here's, here are my thoughts on it. Number one, I think legacy is much more than, than materialistic things or, or property or money. Sure. I, I also think that we drop parts of our legacy all the time. You know, like I think sometimes mm -hmm. when people hear legacy, they're they're thinking of this this package that we're leaving with a bow on it. But mm -hmm. we're our legacy is just evolving through what we're doing every day. That that's how I look at it. I love that. That makes me feel a little bit better. I feel good. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay! Then <clears throat> in that context, I hope that I leave every conversation with a little bit of legacy where. People are coming away feeling inspired and maybe more clear, yeah. perhaps have a better sense of what they need to do for themselves to advance their goals so that they can look back on that conversation. What business unrelated can just say, wow, Brandon really helped give me some thoughts or clear direction or a tip to move my move the needle on whatever is important to me. Absolutely. I endeavor to do that. Yeah. And, you know, coming back to um, alchemy of, of money, what another thing that I wanted to really like talk a little bit about is the fact that from what I can see, from what I've gathered, this is really a community. It's not just a menu of services that you, I mean, you can hire, uh, you know, people on your team or the service, but it's really a community that you've created. And can you talk a little bit about that? And uh, and I'm assuming that was intentional and very important to you. Yes, it 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 really has become a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are all going there, so to speak, with their finances and saying, let's learn more. Let's figure out what's not working and how to improve it. Let's be proactive with our finances. That's been super rewarding, actually, to watch that community grow we're doing a few things to bring that community together. We have still still so many more opportunities that we need to execute on to to codify that. But Did you refer to your clients as members, I think I've heard you say, right? We do. We call them members. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I am that shows up both in our our economic model and how we do a monthly membership, but also in how we're delivering education and curriculum. We have a member call every mm -hmm. month and a variety of other member offerings that around financial topics. We've got a big tax class actually coming up here for our members in a couple of weeks. So you're hundred percent right. It, it, we've really brought together a fun group of entrepreneurs around the country in almost all States in the U S of a variety of different brokerage brands that have said, I'm raising my hand because I want to get better at my finances. How do I do it? And that's been really exciting to see. Yeah. And I think that's important to note that while your ideal client is a realtor, this is not a Keller Williams only company. This is this is a, a a company that is for every agent, regardless of association. That's correct. We have uh, members from all the major brands and a variety of, of regional and some local brands as well, independent brokerages. It's it's really been fun to see that grow across all these different brands. Nice. So Brandon, is there a question I didn't ask you that you wished I had? Oh, you're asking some great questions. I love it. No, that's great. I, uh, maybe the, the, how do you reach me question? Yeah, let's do that. The easiest way is just to go to our website, which is alchemyofmoney.co. 
alchemyofmoney.co, A-L, alchemy, A-L, um, C-H-E-M-Y. And uh, it's not .com because it was like $20,000 to get alchemyofmoney.com. I was like, that's not a good financial I'm decision. not surprised. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a I love alchemy of money though. What why was that the name that you chose? So I chose it because I feel like money at first feels somewhat mystical and magical. But when you learn more about it, you realize it's extremely formulaic. And alchemy as a word is both. If you look it up, right? It's got the magical, mystical, but then it's also a formula or a recipe. Mm -hmm. So I was like, ah, oh, that is how money shows up for people. And so I landed on that word. I also had someone uh, do an exercise with me to come up with like a one word that represents me as a human in the course of my life. And he ended up coming up with uh, the alchemist. And he said, there's sort of a magical touch thing you've got going on. But if somebody gets to know you well, they realize you're extremely strategic and formulaic about how you actually advance things. So it was the combination of those two exercises, a personal one, and then a thoughtful one about the word and how that might relate to the topic that we're building around helping people with money. I love that. That's so great. Okay. So alchemyofmoney.co is your website. Yes. And if someone listening to today's podcast is inspired to want to talk to you more. Uh, is it you that they talk to or some other people on their team? So I am doing all the discovery calls and most all of them anyway. So yeah, I, I like to be in the front, uh, understanding what people need and what the, what the challenges are so I can shape the team at Alchemy. So it's, it's a big part of my role here at Alchemy. So if you go to the website at the top right-hand corner, it says book discovery call. Chances are very high that's going to be with me. That's so cool. That's great. And uh, where else can people find you, follow you, get some more information about you? I know you have a blog that's on your website. Yes. And if you're on Instagram, Brandon Green Now is my handle on Instagram. Awesome. And we're going to have you in my area. Um, yes. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, when this is going to be dropping, but we are going to have you in a couple weeks in New York to teach your workshop, Alchemy of Money. We're excited about that. So it's important to note that if uh, there is, you know, a broker or a manager of a company listening and would like to bring you in, you do workshops as well. Yes, indeed. I have an all day workshop. I can't wait to deliver it for your team. We're going to have a great time. I know. I can't wait to give you a big hug and say hello. Absolutely. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. This was really great. And I, I trust that you really uh, touched somebody and inspired someone to take action. And um, I hope they call you for that. And uh, But I just feel like this was such a great, honest conversation. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Anna. Great questions. You're doing a great job interviewing. I loved it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thank that. You. I'm having a lot of fun with this, I have to say. So uh, <laughs> please uh, subscribe and share and <laughs> Absolutely. put it out there to your sphere. And all of you listening, if you found value in this today, I'd love for you to share it too. So thanks again. We'll see you soon.